Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Daniel Munich. Uh, I am uh, the executive director of IDEA at CERSH EI, and I welcome you very much at this uh, symposium, which we have called uh, How to Govern the Country Better. Uh, it's an example of good practice for employment policy from our neighbors from Germany and from closer neighbors from Bavaria. And uh, uh, I hope the all the presentations and the parallel sessions will be inspiring for all of you. Uh, before we start today, uh, please check that you have the program because we have many things happening today, not only coffee break and lunch and uh, wine uh, toast at the end, but uh, many other things, so do not leave earlier. The program was available at the entry. Uh, before we start, uh, I will give a uh, word uh, to two important people here. Uh, one on my left is uh, the director of CERSHI, Michal Kejak. So, he has some welcome words for you. <coughs> I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here, and uh, especially our dear guest from, uh, from Germany, who will be participating in organizing this, this workshop today. Uh, CERGI is the Center for Economic, is joint workplace of the Center for Economic Research and Women Education of Charles University and the Economics Institute of Czech Academy of Sciences. Our institution has been established 27 years ago and is a unique institution in uh, the region. As our mission states, first, building a recognized center of excellence and innovation in economics research and education. Our international body of faculties and researchers uh, fully reflects this uh, as they hold uh, PhD degrees from top econ departments around the world, including uh, University of Chicago, Princeton, or London School of Economics. Second, uh, expanding the pool of elite economists in Central and Eastern Europe and beyond to serve the public interest. Our international student body is coming from more than 35 countries and they found their uh, jobs in academia, prestigious international organizations, and top uh, private companies. Third, producing and disseminating policy-oriented economic research. This work is concentrated in the IDEA, the Institute for Democracy and Economic Analysis, where, uh, as already Daniel Milik mentioned, he's a, he's, a, he's a chief of it, as a project of the Institute, Inst Economics Institute and was established in 2010. Our institution has recently expanded in quality, its scope, and its size. We regularly publish in top five world economic journals. We currently hold two prestigious uh, European Research Council grants. Uh, we, uh, as a reflection of our concentration of the, of the research in Czech Republic, we produce two-thirds of all research output in top design of world impact journals. The amount of the applied and evidence-based policy analysis further accelerated by introducing, introducing uh, the initiative of uh, Czech Academy of Sciences uh, called Strategy for 21st Century, a program for excellent applied research in the Czech Republic with Daniel Mini coordinating the effective policy, public policy and today's society research program. And special project aimed at the comprehensive analysis of research and development and innovation sector. By getting more funding from the Czech Academy of Sciences, uh, we also extended the size of our core faculty members. But I would like to emphasize today and acknowledge the long-term cooperation between SERGI I and IAB, uh, launched by COST project uh, via Minister of Education, uh, Youth and Sport. The success in obtaining third-party funded uh, project called Bavarian Czech Labor Market Effects of Foreign Direct Investment actually is a supporter and uh, co-organizing uh, this, uh, this symposium which is currently taking place here today. The similarity of hot labor markets issues in both countries are, um, are very important and such as digitalization, minimum wages, skill shortages, gender wage gap and so on. I would like to ex explicitly name uh, several people, Mrs. Radka Bonackova as a project manager and representative of the funding body, the Bavarian Czech Academy Agency, Česko-Bavarská Vysokoškolská Agentura, and Professor Joachim Müller as a leading representative of all participants from the Institute for Employment, IAB. Finally, in general, I would like to thank to all speakers uh, in the event and wish all participants fruitful, informative and exciting uh, event. Thank you very much. Uh, you have to turn it on. So.
So, uh, before I give floor to uh, Dr. Michael Moritz, I will introduce him, but briefly, uh, some important part from his uh, career. He's, by the way, the dri driving force uh, of the collaboration since the very early beginning, and maybe from uh, the history you will see why. He studied economics, search the IS Economic Institute, and Czech philology at the universities of Regensburg, Green, meaning Brno, and Prague <laughs> from 94 to 2002, uh, with special focus on regional economics, foreign uh, trade theories, and econometrics. More than that, he spent, uh, I'm not sure, one or two years in, uh, at the University of West, Bo uh, West Bohemia in Pilsen, 2002-2004. So you can guess that he learned some Czech. He can now present to you, you'll see how good student he was. And uh, he got his uh, doctoral degree in, uh, at the University of Regensburg. And uh, since 2007, he is a research staff member of, at IIB. What brief, now I will give the floor to him to introduce uh, his uh, mission here. <laughs> and I will share with you. Thank you, Daniel. 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 Thank je to v pořádku? Pořád? Nebo? Ja, ja, Těší nás váš zájem o toto sympozium. Jak možná víte, Praha a Norimberg jsou partnerská města spojená dlouhodobými vztahy. Nejlepším příkladem je Zlatá cesta, která spojovala města od posledního středu věku. Není město geografický a historický práce tak blízké, jako je Norimberg, zdůraznil bývalý starosta Prahy v roce 1990 při podpisu smlouvy o partnerství měst. Dovolte mi říct, že je to stále fascinující přijeto tohoto naterního města po nové trase, respektive dálnice Via Karolina, přes ranici u Whitehouse rozvadová bez jakékoliv překážky. Když si uvědomíme situaci před 30, 30 lety a politické nepokoje na několika místech po celém světě a také v Evropské unii, nemůžeme tuto skutečnost ani v těchto dnech považovat za samozřejmost. A teďka dovolte mi změnit jazyk na angličtinu o této chvíli. <laughs> tak, so let me switch to the conference language and proceed in English now. So thank you, Professor Kejak, for the opportunity to implement this symposium here at IDEA, SERGI. It's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you on behalf of the co-organizing institution of the event, the Institute for Employment Research, or shortly called, called IAB. Not only are Prague and Nuremberg twin cities, as just mentioned, also, our institute, SERGI and IAB, maintain a long-term relationship, starting some 12 years ago with a project on the economic development in the Czech Bavarian borderlands, together with Daniel Munich from the start. And actually, this topic is a good example of how integrated labor markets can benefit both employers and employees. While in the first years after the fall of the Iron Curtain here and there, fears were raised with respect to adverse impacts of open borders, some dark scenarios have fortunately proved unfounded. Apart from some minor adjustment effects in the beginning, no tremendously negative effects could be observed for the overall cross-border labor market. In contrast, the lowering and abolishment of entry barriers on the labor market has been leading to a dynamic development on both sides of the border, and the proficiency of commuters is appreciated in the firm units both in Bavaria and in the Czech Republic. We are very happy that uh, Czech-Bavarian relations improved in every respect in a positive way during the last decades. So last year, as already mentioned, um, our follow-up project started uh, as again as a research partnership of SERGI and, and IIB and actually this project opens 
up the opportunity to arrange this meeting today. So this year we plan this symposium and next year there will be another one focusing on uh, scientific um, studies uh, concerning the Czech Bavarian labor market. And uh, in this regard, let me express thanks to the institutions and people that assisted us in arranging today's event. So first let me mention the representation of the Free State of Bavaria to the Czech Republic, and particularly to uh, the head of the representation, Dr. Hannes Lachmann, who actually phoned hours for hours and helped us to set up the, the panel discussion. Hannes, thank you very much for helping us so much. Then um, I would like to thank the German Embassy and uh, also the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and many other institutions. Uh, there are so many, I can't name uh, uh, every institution uh, which published the notice of the event. And of course, as already mentioned by Professor Kelchak, the Czech Bavarian Academic Agency represented by Ms. Bonakova, uh, who funds the project. Last but not least, many thanks to Blanka Yavarova, who arranged all the details and seemingly responded to thousands of questions and emails we, we had uh, uh, before the conference. Okay, coming now to the first uh, part of the event. The title of today's symposium is how to govern the country better, an example of good practice for employment policy. I hope you do not misunderstand it. As a matter of fact, during the process of planning this symposium, that is the last six months, the governments changed in Germany, in Bavaria and in the Czech Republic. So luckily we did not name the event how to form a new government very quickly. As far as I can speak for the situation in Germany, we have enough evidence now that Germany is definitely not an example of good practice <laughs> regarding the fast establishment of a new government. Anyway, concerning labor market research, what actually can we discuss in the country exhibiting the month-by-month -month lowest unemployment rate throughout the European Union, now at a level just over 2%, followed by Germany having the second lowest unemployment rate in the European Union. So what's the sense of uh, labor market symposium in the top two countries regarding <laughs> unemployment rates? And one of the answers was already mentioned by, mentioned by Professor Kejak that there are several similarly pressing issues on both the Czech and German labor market. And that leads me now finally to the first item on the agenda. Um, we consider this event actually as a mutual exchange of knowledge and what our institute, the IIB, can offer is to share its more than 50 years lasting experience in investigating labor market issues. So thanks again for coming, enjoy the conference and now I will hand over to the director of the IIB, Professor Joachim Möller, as the first speaker of uh, the event to uh, talk about the role of research the Institute for German Employment Policy. So please, you have in your floor. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. I have a long uh, history of contacts to, to Serge. Um, I have been working together with Marit Nekola in Regensburg at the University of Regensburg as a chair of Czech language there. And we together, we organized a conference already in the 1990s on the collaboration of the two, two countries. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a long tradition for me and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and thank you for the invitation. How to govern the country better? Uh, Michael already mentioned it. Uh, is Germany a role model? Think of the Berlin airport, uh, <laughs> German <laughs> rail always being late. So there are some problems in the country. but. Uh, with respect to the labor market, I think we can say that the, the cooperation between research and policy making is, in, in my view, really a role model. And we have some successes in, in, this, uh, in this area regarding, for example, the evaluation of labor market programs or another uh, example, the design of the best 
policy that could be made on, on, the, on the labor market. We, uh, we have a lot of instruments for, for doing excellent research and I will talk about that and it's mainly done uh, at our institute. <coughs> so uh, let me start with the legal framework, so to speak. Um, the IAB is a, a, is a very special institute. We are part of the um, Federal Employment Services, which is a huge organization with roughly 100,000 uh, workers there, all spread all over the country, all over Germany. <coughs> and the, the headquarter of this Federal Employment Services is, is located in Nuremberg. And we are the research institute of this huge organization, which definitely organize all the, the labor market measures we have in, in, in Germany. And we are giving advice to, to, the, to, to the, this uh, organization. We are an independent research institute, so we, we, we do not, um, we, we are not um, dependent on, on, on the, the, the head of the, the institutions, for example, this, this labor, uh, federal labor market uh, services. Uh, that, that's important because without this independent status, research is worthless in my view. It's, it's, this is the basic of, of what we are doing. But we have, uh, if, when I say it's, it's a special situation of our institute, we have statutory obligation to do research on the labor market um, for two spheres. The first sphere is unemployment insurance. By the way, the Unemployment insurance organization is, so to speak, self-governed. So this federal employment service is not directly dependent on, on, the, on the federal government. It's self-governed, and the, the, the three parties are the unions, the employers association, and the, the, uh, and the uh, policy um, um, uh, people. So the, the, the three parties, they, they govern the, the, the institution. And for the, the, uh, the social assistant, is a little bit different. So roughly 25% of our budget comes directly from the Ministry of Labor. And this is for research with respect to social assistance. Well, that's the general um, framework. And what, what is very special, we, were, we are all authorized to use administrative data for research purposes. And this gives us a very good position in doing empirical research. Because the social security data are collected in Nuremberg. So we have access to, to this huge data set. It's very, more or less everybody who works in Germany and pays social contribution is in the data set. And we can go back to 1975 uh, on a daily basis. So it's a huge data set and it's a wonderful uh, source for, for doing uh, empirical research. Um, the IAB was founded in 1967, so last year we had Michael already mentioned it, we had uh, our 15th anniversary and the idea was to, uh, the, 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 the founding idea, or the, the founding period was that, uh, in the controversy at that time, and it's quite interesting, I think, on the impact of automation on the labor market, that this discussion needed scientific um, assistance. And so that, and today we we also talk very much on, on, the, on the on the effects of digitization, for example, on the economy. And already 50 years ago, we we, we had this uh, this uh, debate. And, and the second one, of course, the, the research um, on the labor market as a basis for policy advice. Today, the institute has roughly 270. 270 full-time equivalents. In person we are more than 400 and because we have a lot of part-time uh, uh, work in, within the Institute. And roughly 190 <coughs> researchers doing this research. But it sounds a lot, but you have to uh, keep in mind that uh, roughly 50 researchers are 
distributed all over Germany and they are they form regional teams and they are advising the, the, the regional uh, organization of the federal uh, uh, employment services. So, <clears throat> but we are a, a big institute without a doubt and it's um, um, we, we are divided in 15 research departments covering all aspects of the labor market and I think we were quite successful during the last 20 years, I would say, in having a relatively strong publication uh, record and we have a worldwide network of, of, um, of researchers that, that, are, that are coming to the Institute or working with our data and I will come to that point uh, later on because it, I think it's very it's crucial for, for the, the success of our Institute. And I think one can say that we are the leading institution for labor market research and, and policy advice in, in Germany. Uh, we have roughly 800 articles in the press every month uh, mentioning the, the, the research of, of the IOB. And uh, in 2004, it was roughly 80 articles per month, so it really has more or less uh, followed an exponential path. The, the public uh, 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 interest in, in what we are what we are doing. We have these rich data resources. I will come to that in a minute, and a very active research data center. Uh, so distributing the data for external researchers is a very is an extremely important strategic decision we made roughly 15 years ago. So, what are our focal themes today? We have um, defined four big themes for our research at the moment. One is migration and integration. Of course, the integration of refugees is one of the aspects there. We have a survey on, on, on this uh, group. Um, very interesting research work because we have to do the interviews in different languages, etc. So it was a lot of uh, inno innovative um, uh, things to, to uh, the problems to be, well, it was innovative methods that were introduced in this context. But migration is also another important point for, for Germany. We are, have a shrinking population and we have uh, in, in the last years a relatively strong in, inflow of other European workers, by the way, not from the Czech Republic. I know that the uh, Czechs are uh, very, uh, uh, they are not very mobile because the company, <laughs> because the beer is so good in the country, so I would say. <laughs> but for example, from from Poland, uh, we have a lot of, of inflow. So, so migration is is a is a big topic and will be um, will be important in the future, perhaps even. A more um, uh, 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 more important part of our work. Work in a digitized world. I already mentioned it was already 50 years ago uh, a basic topic. But what's happening now is, <coughs> as an as an old man, I'm, I'm I'm not really sure whether it's really new what we are seeing in, uh, on the labor market because. Also in the past, we had a lot of structural change, but there were some argument that saying that this time is different. This time is different because of the the, the, um, uh, the speed of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the progress and the, what, what's going on in, in this uh, context. And, but as a labor market, it's extremely interesting uh, to to do research or. This, uh, in, in this field, and we have this information, for example, on the, on the competences and tasks people are doing in the different professions. So we can um, uh, we can argue that, that some of these tasks and and competence will become perhaps worthless in the future because of digitization, and we can observe the process what's going on there. Our in general, um, 
thesis in this aspect is that we we have we should not have the fear that the, the, the labor demand is going down because of this technique, because new tasks and new competence are, competence are required in the future. There will be new professions, etc. So in the past it was always the case that uh, if um, some, something was shrinking in the economy, other parts were, were, uh, were, were growing, and I think this is the same uh, this time. Long-term recipients of social benefits. This keeps to be a problem to, to be a problem in, in the German labor market. We have some successes in the field. Compared to 2005, there are, there's a decline in long-term uh, unemployment, but um, there's a hard core of long-term unemployed. It's very hard to find measures to integrate these um, people. But we, we know a lot of things, how, what, are, what determines the factors that someone becomes long-term unemployed and uh, has no chance of being integrated in the labor market uh, again. But this is also, I think, really an important research. And the quality of employment, another point. For example, we have research on the minimum wage, or we have um, research on, uh, um, uh, on, the, on the conditions of, of employment. Uh, also uh, in a, a very important field of our, of our work. Talking about the IB, I think one has to say that we have, uh, we follow a strategic triad and the strategic triad means that we combine excellent research on the one hand with the data resources we have and with policy advice. And these three things, they are closely linked together. And this helps us to extend our knowledge on, on um, employment and living chances of individuals in Germany. And the, in, I think the, uh, it's important to have this, this research search to, for, to fostering the effective and efficient use of labor market instruments. Um, the, I think I can skip this one because um, uh, I would like to talk about the excellent data resources uh, uh, we have um, and the, I think the important thing is that we combine the, the administrative data, the registered data with service on firms or uh, employees and this gives uh, not only wonderful research uh, possibilities but also is the basis of our policy advice. Um, so I talk about the strategic decision we made that we are, we, are not, we do not try to monopolize the, the research data we have at our institute um, and we opened so-called data access points all over the world and you see the, the, the really the top institution in the US uh, uh, where it's possible to to, to have data access to the Nuremberg. There's a big issue of data protection, and but we are really uh, we, have, we have a lot of um, uh, possibilities to, to 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 keep a very strict data prote uh, protection rules, and uh, also at the same time allowing uh, working with, with, for, for the search with, with our data. So it's a sort of remote access. And there's a, a data protection control in Nuremberg. It costs us some resources, but the, um, we have a huge um, um, uh, advantage of this. There are more than 1,000 projects all over the world doing uh, research with the German data. Uh, and this is, of course, reflected to our research. We have a lot of cooperation because of that, and we have um, we gain knowledge about the labor, the labor market, which we can give back, for example, as policy, policy advice, etc. For example, we have a, an, an, uh, 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 one of our um, uh, uh, workers, a research young researcher at the institute. He worked together with David Card uh, on the 
the reasons of inequality. The inequality is rising, where the uh, earnings are inequality. And to, together with, with, the, with the data we have, and the excellent methodological knowledge of David Card in Berkeley, there um, was a study on, on uh, arguing what are the reasons for, for, the, for the growing wage inequality in, in, in Germany. And that gave, and it's published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, so it's in the top journal. It's not the only case, there are several other possibilities in, in, this, uh, in this field. And so, so we profited from that, from the, from the methods and, you know, of, the, of, the, of the top researchers, and uh, I think they profit from us because we, we, are, we did all these methodological and, and data things. Also in, in Europe, we, we are expanding our uh, data access point. We have in, in the UK two access points, now in Paris. Yesterday there was a um, small workshop in, in Regensburg to extend this data access point all over, over Europe. And this should be a, a mutual process, so the, the French uh, data is accessible now in Nuremberg, and our data are accessible in, in, in Paris. So that perhaps it could be an idea to do the same with uh, Prague in, in the future, but we will have to uh, talk about this. So this uh, slide shows you that the administrative data are at the very heart of, uh, of our uh, data resources, and uh, it's process generated from, from the social security uh, process, and we have the survey data. For example, we have the, the, uh, the biggest establishment survey in, in Germany, so-called Betriebspanel, or we have other uh, surveys on, on firms in, in, in Germany. Uh, we have the, in the social security, or the social assistance field, we have a special, specific survey panel data, and so we can combine the survey data with the administrative data. And this is, uh, I think, the speciality of, of the institute and uh, the, the source of success. Um, Evidence-based policy, policy advice. I think that's uh, also very typical for the IED. Um, not to discuss labor market issues on the ideological level, but showing the, the, the relations with, uh, with the help of data. That, that's, I, I think that's the motto of our, of our uh, research. And of course, we have to be neutral in our analysis. And we have uh, the quality control is very important, what we are saying because we have a lot of impact on the labor market policy in Germany. We have to be very careful in this respect. It should, uh, quality um, should, um, uh, should, should be considered. And we have the principle to make everything what we do um, available to the public. And we, we, um, we, we do not accept of, um, grants from, from, from uh, outside organizations, for example, also from the ministry, if they are saying the research is, cannot be published. We, we refuse to, to do this, uh, these sort of pro projects. Um, and I think that that's, that should be done in this way, because we are a public institution. And, uh, this is the information is, should be free for the public. Uh, and why should it be free? Because it's also a sort of quality control. Because if it's published, then somebody else can, can argue uh, uh, against it. And, and uh, you can improve your, your, your methods, etc. So that's, I think, crucial for, for our work. As an example for evidence-based policy, it's an uh, um, example from the minimum wage. I, myself, I did some work on that. We had some sector minimum wage already in Germany before we introduced um, uh, statutory minimum wage uh, for the whole economy. Um, and we, we found out that the, the uh, minimum wage was uh, in, in, a, in a moderate head is not, um, will not lead to, to massive disemployment effects. 
And, but before the, the introduction of the statutory minimum in Germany, there was a huge discussion, and it was mainly driven by ideological positions. And uh, so, for example, the, uh, the EFO Institute <laughs> so argued that there will be, would, would be um, um, uh, a loss of almost one million uh, employees, uh, working places in Germany, because of the uh, minimum wage. Um, our ex post analysis says that uh, there was, might be a minus of 60,000, which is almost in the, in the, uh, in the significant uh, range, we cannot say that's really uh, uh, highly significant. But you see it's, it's an order of magnitude lower than was the ideological position. But we can show it with the data, with difference and difference method, with uh, methods of, uh, using microdata, and we have this uh, uh, the first January 2015 as a, the point where, where the, the minimum wage was, was introduced. We, we have the firm information, the, the individual information, so we can be relatively sure that, uh, that we, are, we are right in this <coughs> position. And this is evidence-based research, research in how we interpret this. So, thank you very much for listening, and if there are some questions, um, Look forward to answering it. But so, I think we have a discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> we have time for some few questions now. If there are some. <coughs> my name is uh, my name is Phil Kaplan and uh, I am from Brunswick Institute of Results. And uh, I would like to ask you about the quality of employment, because it's a big uh, <coughs> question now in the Czech Republic. You said that we are the top country of unemployment, or not unemployment, but the salaries are on the level of the minimum wage of Germany. So I see this as a big problem, because uh, at first, the Czech industry in 80-85% is using import and then export uh, something else. Uh, so only 10% is the domestic uh, inquiry from domestic people. It's one. So, so we are correcting for somebody who, who is not the quality as the uh, It's one of the reasons of the very, very small uh, wage. The second is uh, that Practically, the, the political isolation which is now coming to the Czech Republic, you can see uh, last reports from the Czech Castle, which is uh, absolutely opposite to Václav Havel's reports. It's a uh, uh, very, very logical consequence of this kind of thing. Because Czech people cannot go outside, they can drink beer, they can have a very nice meat, they can have a good uh, food, good uh, kindergartens and everything, but good, good school care, but cannot go outside. If they go outside, they have uh, money uh, less than unemployed people in the, in the uh, advanced world. So now I think it's a very essential problem of the Czech democratic future. So if you have some answers, some some advice, something for the children in the children. It's a really difficult question. I'm not an expert for the Czech economy, but what I can say as an economist, of course, the, the low wages, we, as an economist, we know that it's also this relation to productivity. What is the productivity role for, for wages? Um, and productivity depends on investment and, and investment and technology. And we, we are discussing at the moment, by the way, the, this so-called productivity puzzle because of the digitization, but we should expect huge increases in productivity of human work. But we do not see it in the aggregate figures, not in the, in the US, not in the, in the UK or in the in Germany or other countries. So, um, but it could be that 
things will be changing in the future, that the, the, the new technology needs sometimes to become effective and then it will increase the productivity. So uh, my, my answer in general would be it, it should, wages and productivity should at least in, in, the, in the medium and long run should be related. And um, you, you cannot, uh, and I'm in favor of a moderate minimum wage, but you cannot, in, in the end, you cannot um, fix a wage rate that's quite above the, the productivity of people, and then you will have these employment losses. So one should be rather careful with the, with the, uh, with the uh, intervention of the state in this, in this respect. So my answer would be increase productivity of all people. And this is a question of education, of vocational training, of uh, also could be a, a question of mobility. To find the best places where, where a specific person can be. So it's, this is the organization of, of, the, of the labor market uh, uh, again. So you shouldn't waste resources, human resources, in uh, having people in, in, a, in a wrong position. Could do better, better in another position. That's, I think that would be my, my general answer. So, Daniel would like to comment? Yeah. What's being neglected in the Czech public frequently in those debates is that the aggregate productivity to partly or to great extent depends also on the efficiency of the regulation of management, public management and private management, simply how things are being organized. So it's not only about whether people are smart or not so smart, because Czechs and Germans are rather similar in those intellectual comparisons. Of course, we might be lacking in the real technology and quality of machines and computers and these things. We don't have so many of them. But important part of it, and if you look at the international uh, comparison, Czech Republic is lagging behind mostly in the quality of public governance, efficiency. How things are coordinated, regulated, the quality of laws, and all these uh, tax offices and other things. Just a comment that uh, it's not only about people and firms, it's a lot about the public governance. But the problem is what is the first and what is the second? Of course, it's the mutually the related. It's the That's consequence yeah. of, the, of the situation which yeah. we are facing. Okay, so um, uh, regarding the time schedule, <laughs> um, I would like to continue with the next presentation and ask uh, Martin Dietz the long-term head of the IAB Research Coordination to present uh, about the interplay between policies, research and operational business. Yes, thank you very much um, for the nice welcome and the opportunity to speak about our work at the IAB. Um, this one? Okay, thanks. And, um, Yes, I'm uh, Head of Research Coordination at our institute and um, besides doing research in our unit ourselves, we are also kind of a gateway between research and politics and administration and that's why I'm sitting here today, um, not to talk about the research I'm doing, but to talk about how we organize policy advice at our institute. Um, I will start with some, some general remarks on um, scientific policy advice and also try to explain to you um, how we manage not only to answer uh, the questions but also how we manage to ask the right uh, questions so being relevant is one of our aims our targets I will talk about some tensions that evolve in doing policy advice and um, I think some of them are necessarily unsolvable. They have to be tensions in doing policy advice between research and, and politics. That is um, one kind of a necessary condition for um, doing policy advice. But we also spend some time at our institute to think about what might be preconditions for good policy advice. And I will try to <coughs> explain these um, conditions for good policy advice to you. So, Coming back to the uh, triad, um, Joachim Möller was talking about, um, he also explained to you that these three um, um, uh, strategic um, uh, 
targets or um, tasks of the IEB are coming together. So research data and policy advice belong together. And I call policy advice here evidence-based scientific policy advice, a long term. I, I will not use this throughout the, the whole presentation. But what I want to say is that, um, of course, policy advice has to be based on research. So it has to be scientific policy advice. This is what we all claim for our institute is. And it has to be evidence-based because it has to be founded on good or high quality data. So this, um, here you see that evidence-based um, scientific policy advice, these three points are coming together. So what are the claims when you talk about this evidence-based scientific policy advice? Um, of course, we want to answer and ask relevant questions. Um, we want to generate um, um, political impact and impact for society. And of course, we try to make a difference. So um, we want to show that we are worth the money the um, uh, uh, state is paying for us or people are paying for us. And of course, we like to be the research institute um, which comes into your mind when you think, okay, you want to know something about labor market issues. So, if you think um, about the structure of the IAB, Joachim Müller told you there might be some structural problems coming to your mind. So, first with respect to, to quality of research, there might be the question, okay, why should a research institute belonging to a big organization, which is an administration, be able to do good and excellent research? So I hope Joachim Müller convinced you about that, and I think um, you can see that when you look at the publication records. So that's kind of an easy thing to do, but it needs, needs time and a lot, of, a lot of effort, of course. What is perhaps more, um, um, a bigger challenge is to convince people that um, it is possible to do, to do good policy advice when you're belonging to a federal employment agency and you're paid partly by the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. So people might say, okay, why should I trust you? You will all only say what the federal employment agencies want to hear. And the one easy question or easy answer to that question is um, already, has already been mentioned by Joachim too, is independence of research is really um, a, a basic thing for a good policy advice. So we have this independence of research by law, but um, perhaps even more important is that this um, independence of research has been reinforced um, by formal documents um, signed by the Federal Employment Agency and the Ministry of Labor. So um, we have free choice of research questions within our legal framework. Of course, we are talking to people from the Federal Employment Agency, to people which are the main actors on labor market policy. We'll talk about that um, later on. But the decision of um, the projects we are running is ours. Of course, it's also our decision to, to take a choice um, regarding the research methods because this is our business. And it's important that, of course, the results are ex ante um, undeterminate and will be generated within the re research process. So we are not um, doing research and the result will be what the Federal Employment Agency wanted to be the result. So, and one thing to assure is this is really that we have the freedom to publish our results and we do this. Um, so it is clear from the beginning that every question you, you, you ask uh, the IAB, you will get an answer, but the answer will be given to the whole public too. So there's no kind of a mystery about what we are doing, but it's um, a transparent, a transparency is a quite important factor for our work. So um, this documents um, given to us by the Federal Employment Agency and the Ministry of Labor is also a kind of a reflection of the main addresses of our research that only independent research is of value for, for the public and also for the organization as a whole. When implementing policy advice um, for us, um, neutrality is, is crucial for doing good policy advice. Of course, we are oriented towards political decisions. We are talking about hot topics. We are doing research on hot topics, but we are not engaged for some specific interest groups or political parties. That's quite important to uh, gain credibility um, with your policy advice. So how do we manage to, to ask the right questions? Um, 
I think what is our um, advantage at the Institute and perhaps kind of a unique feature of the IAB is that we can <coughs> combine our scientific knowledge uh, with institutional and political knowledge. So we have the specific access to um, the operational businesses and also to political processes and that's um, an advantage we, we try to use and you use it for not only for policy advice but also for, for our research. So we are talking to, to the headquarters, um, we are talking to the regional directorates like um, Joachim Müller has um, um, told you before that we have these 10 teams in different um, places in, all, all over Germany uh, doing policy advice directly at the regional level. We are talking to the self-government board um, of the Federal Employment Agency, which is quite an um, uh, important um, um, opportunity for us because in this self-government board we find different actors of, on, the lab, the, uh, on the labor market with different opinions. So you have unions, employers, associations and also the ministries together. And of course there won't be uh, uh, um, uh, too, too many um, opportunities that they say, okay, we all, we all have the same opinion. So you can really discuss your research, research results um, within the political players. And we of course have regular meetings with the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs and so we are trying to generate and also discuss our research topics together with stakeholders and by that we um, try to generate also the relevant questions for our research and our policy advice. So let me come to, to the tensions that might arise when we talk about policy advice. First, um, the problem might be time because uh, normally politics need very quick answers, they don't have time, but research needs time. Um, for example, data may not be available, so what happens today is in the data of tomorrow, so you won't be able to, to give an answer in the next two days, as normally is um, what would be liked by, by politics or administration. Or maybe when you look at flight migration, um, data has to be collected even before you can think about how a re research project look like, looks like. So you need really time and you have to talk about that um, with politics and also with the administration again and again. Um, and maybe some questions cannot be answered by research at all. So that's also the fact um, that um, we have to give advice and this is also part of our work to our main addressees um, to put the question right. So what is a question that can be answered by research. What is a question where you really don't need research? Perhaps there's good controlling and you, or you have a look at statistics. This might be enough to get a good answer or an uh, answer that is good enough for that question. Um, perhaps there might be um, the use of new, new data um, to, to answer that question. So that's also a very important part of our work to, to do advice on getting the questions right. What is perhaps Gesine Stefan will talk about in, in the, the afternoon when, when it's about the evaluation of labor market programs. Um, it's also important to do good research and policy advice to be involved within um, new um, legislations or the, the development of new labor market instruments early enough so you can really think about what is a good evaluation design when you are designing the instrument or the law and not only when you're enacting the law and you say okay now you're going to evaluate that and we have to say okay it's not possible because there's no good design for doing the evaluation anymore because there are so many things you, you decided about which are not um, um, accessible for, for a good research. So what helps um, and what is one important feature of the IAB with this history of, of 50 years is that we have um, permanent expertise on core topics of labor market policy. So we have a lot of people who have a good experience and a long experience and are able to do this policy advice on a stable personal basis for specific topics. That's I think different from universities where people are just a couple of years and then they, they move to another university. And so here we have like a stability of contact for, um, for people they know, whom they talk to, and they know what they, what they said five or six years ago. 
and also specialized units at the gateway between research <coughs> and politics and administration might help to organize this policy advice. Perhaps the more severe tension um, I like to talk about is um, that the results might not be liked by everybody in the politics or uh, administration. Um, and I think this is kind of an unsolvable uh, tension because when you see the political spectrum, it's not possible to have a result everybody likes the same. So, um, and if you have a situation like um, everybody is happy with what the uh, IAB is doing, probably we do something wrong. <laughs> um, that might be from time to time uh, the case, but normally it's not the case that everybody likes what we do. So, but there is some kind of medicine or um, some measure that might alleviate uh, pain. And um, one is transparency and equal treatment. So all results will be published. I talked about that before. And that also means that we're not only publishing results um, the unions are disliking, but we're also publishing um, results um, the employees associations are disliking. So from time to time, everybody will be harmed a little <laughs> by our results. Um, and this kind of transparency and equal treatment is a, is a measure which is like, um, I think, good for a kind of a um, hygiene on, on, the, on the policy advice. A reputation of political neutrality that, and objectiveness that is what is meant also by this equal treatment. And of course, also kind of a fair and direct communication to the main addresses of policy advice. So we don't like to, to surprise the headquarters by results. Normally, they get a result one or two days before, so they prepare it when it's in the newspapers. So this is kind of a communication strategy, which is not, I think, not, not a problem for, um, for research and not, not, not a problem for the policy advice, but it's just um, uh, 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 one measure to have a good and fair communication with people. You don't own, and you're not only meeting once alive, but every day. So um, this is the last point on, on this slide, because um, policy advice is not a one-shot game. You're not on market on a, on, a, on a market where we just meet once and then you do your policy advice and you never see again. But it's a permanent process of policy advice. Um, so what helps, in our opinion, is that um, we have a kind of a institu institutionalized communication with our main addressees in the self-government board and we have direct interaction with uh, these different um, um, parties and different actors on the labor market with different opinions so we have kind of a checks and balances with respect to our research results. So the preconditions we are we're developing for good policy advice are first really transpar transparency, the publication of results also um, open our own re results to the debate, like Joachim Müller said, um, is also important. So we don't uh, have something to hide, but we want to also um, open it to the public debate, um, what we are doing. Um, what helps is kind of a structured knowledge about what um, people do with our research. So. Um, if you, you know what in the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, how do they um, work with the research you're doing? What do they do with the policy advice? Uh, how do they work with your results? So if you know about these processes, it's easier to, to give good policy advice because you can um, um, prepare it better to, to the needs of the agency. So offering short trainings or internships um, with, with respect to these political structures may also be helpful for doing good policy advice. Um, and very important at the beginning of um, policy advice is um, to be able to, to have a common or shared, shared understanding about the research question. So be sure to know what is the question um, the people are um, posing to you because um, that's not it's not easy. Sometimes you get only a short email um, and with a short question, but you don't know, okay, um, for which year, for which region, what is the really question in detail. You start to work and you, and you see, okay, there are a lot of problems and unsolved um, questions on this, re on this uh, question um, that has been posed to you. And you have to qualify, uh, clarify these um, at the beginning. Uh, otherwise, you will have a lot of problems um, and disappointments at the end when you finish your, your research 
and um, you have your report and people say, okay, this was not the question I was <laughs> posing you. So um, do this uh, um, uh, at the beginning um, of the policy advice. Comprehensibility is important. Not everybody at the ministry or also at the Federal Employment Agency has a background in research. So be sure that the language you use can be understood by the other side. So um, try to speak the language of uh, the addressee of normal people, of people who are working in this field but who are not researchers. And here it's um, like kind of a quality control, Joachim Möller was speaking about. It's not only on the quality of research, but it's also on the question um, uh, of um, comprehensibility of com uh, communication. And we also have a lot of um, publication um, products targeting at a broader audience where we just try to put our research in a context that people outside of research can understand what we are talking about. And um, finally, um, this is again the point that it's not a one-shot game, but it's a permanent relation between research, between the IAB and the main addressees. We try to have regular talks once or twice a year with the main addressees on general questions of research and policy advice. So this is a kind of a prevention uh, mechanism um, to talk about this regular um, uh, uh, basic um, functioning of policy advice might help in situations when you have a conflict. So perhaps you can say, okay, we talked last year about that. You know, this is a general problem. It's not only in this case. Um, please remember, and um, sometimes this helps to, to um, have a little bit less problems in, in critical situations when really people say, okay, what you're doing there, your research um, result, that cannot be, cannot be right. I'm, I'm not. Uh, so have, having problems with the research results. Okay, so let me try to draw some conclusions. Um, what we try at the Institute is to, to combine uh, somehow the best of two worlds, like the freedom and excellence of research on the one hand side, um, and using also this access to institutional political knowledge to do good research and good um, policy advice. and. Um, the problem is to really to, to balance um, the interplay between research and operational business and politics because it needs on the one hand side um, close interaction, communication and uh, also coming together, being close together and on the other hand independence. And that's not easy because um, at first sight it doesn't belong together. Um, and it's um, kind of, of a permanent task to, to do this balancing within the pro process of research and policy advice. Tensions are not a problem or shouldn't be a problem. It's part of the game. So you have to manage um, these um, tensions. And we try to uh, do that. And it's even important to have these tensions to be credible um, outside uh, the, of the Institute for the public with the things you were doing. I think these institutionalized structures are a good uh, method, method to, to be in contact with different players and bringing them together uh, has an advantage to have these discussions about research when they're all in one room, you know, talking to one side and afterwards to the next side and afterwards to the third player, you're talking together, everybody hears the same, so it's good to have this um, kind of uh, conflict prevention and mediation also um, within one room where you all players have together. And um, finally, um, it helps when you're not only <coughs> suggesting or arguing yourself that you're doing good work, but some, sometimes it's good to have some external um, reviews giving a positive uh, feedback to your work. Uh, we have a scientific advisory board doing that for our research. Um, so um, coming twice a year to our institute and kind of evaluating what we are doing uh, in the different fields of research we are doing. Um, and um, this year we will have a big evaluation of the institute by the German Research Council. And they are not only um, looking at the quality of our research, but they are also looking at the knowledge transfer we are doing. So are we doing uh, a good policy advice? Is it generating impact what we are doing? And uh, that's quite important for us. 
And we hope, of course, that uh, we will get a, a positive record, record of um, the German Research Council and this will give us some more credibility and support for the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Again, there's time for some questions. You're saying there are some similarities, of course, and um, of course we are, we are working also together uh, with the uh, statistics of the Federal Employment Agency. So they have a big um, uh, unit doing labor market statistics, and of course we are also working together with um, like the Federal Statistic Office uh, um, in Germany. So and, and somehow uh, perhaps um, the ne in the next presentation. Um, you will hear something about that, that the data we're using for, um, for our research and the data mm -hmm. used by statistics, they of course have somehow the, the same basis, the databases below might be the same, and the, the data we use are, is, is, is done really for um, research um, purposes, and, and so this is probably the main, uh, uh, the main uh, difference um, but we are, we are working together very closely. Maybe one or another short question. So, if this is not the case, we will move on to the uh, concluding presentation concerning the IAB Triad and uh, Silvina Kopstake. Um, with a specialist in the IAB data and IT management, will talk about processing, anonymizing, and providing data from administrative processes for researchers, and as I said, conclude the triad of research, policy advice, and data the IAB tasks. <coughs> Please, Sylvia. Okay. 
um, my name is Sylvia Kopstek and I'm from the Department um, of Data and IT Management at the IRB. And as you've already heard, I would like to introduce the third part of this IRB triad or between research, data and policy advice. Um, I would like to talk about the IRB database, which we've already heard is a very big and unique database. Um, of course, there are lots of different data sources and there are new data sources being explored by researchers all the time. But my main focus is going to be on administrative data we can use because of our special privilege that we are closely connected to the Federal Employment Agency and we are allowed to use their administrative data and also data from other data sources. And we are allowed to use this data for employment research, of course within the limits of data protection regulations. Um, I would like to give you a short introduction to the kind of data we have, the people who are in the data and the information that's available. And then I would also like to say a little bit about how we plan this data to make it available for researchers. And finally about how it's being provided. So the first part is about the database. Um, the data we have is from or the administrative data from different administrative data processes, mostly from the employment agency, but also from social security notifications. All of this data at the Federal Employment Agency is collected in one really big central data warehouse. And at the IRB environment, there are different data providers who use this data, like we've just heard in the question. Um, one of them, is the Federal Employment Agency Statistics Department and the other is at the IRB itself, which is my department, the um, Data and IT uh, Management. The main difference is the way we prepare this data for research. The Statistics Department concentrates on aggregate data on certain monthly reporting dates, um, which gives a more general overview of the labour market and it's also data that's um, published in the official labor market statistics for Germany. Um, on the other hand, we have the data and IT management, and we focus on more individual data preparation. So we have historic data on the basis of an individual person, which dates back to 1975 on a daily basis. Um, the difference is also that it takes a lot more preparation time to to provide this type of data, so it's, it just takes a bit longer before it's published. What we do at the data and IT management is that we organize the data in so-called data products. Um, we try to consolidate and integrate data from lots of different data sources and make it um, provided in a form that's, well, good, that's usable for research. Um, it's possible to get direct extracts from our data products. Um, it's kind of a project specific process and we can get limited extracts for specific research questions. But um, because there are very strict data regulation rules, it's, um, it's not possible to give this, like to give all the data to the <coughs> public. And this is why the IRB has the research data center. Um, and their task is to provide this data in a way that it can be given to the research community and to as many researchers as possible to make them use it. Um, the data is more anonymized and more standardized and can be given out in different forms. Um, now I would just like to give you an overview about our different data sources and where all this data comes from. Like I've already said, it's mostly process-generated data from administrative processes at the Federal Employment Agency. This covers, for example, all the people who have been registered as unemployed and searching for a job at the Federal Employment Agency. So all the agencies across Germany send their data to the central data pool, but all the people who are registered since 1999. Um, they also have the data on participation in active labour market programmes, which is also administered by the employment agency. Um, and the same is true for this data, it's also collected here. And finally, the third part of the um, labour market agency data is the benefit recipient data. 
This comes in two different parts because of the German system is divided into earnings replacement benefits, which is the social well, unemployment security benefits for people who have contributed to the benefit system. And for everybody else, there's also a basic income support for job seekers, um, which is called social assistance, and which is also administered by the Federal Employment Agency. Apart from that, we have also data on employment, and this is from the social security notifications, which have to be given by every company who has employees with a regular employment contract, um, which is given to the health insurance, and then is forwarded to the Federal Employment Agency as well. Um, this contains information on all the people with regular employment contracts in Germany, which is quite a huge number, but there are some exceptions, for example, civil servants and um, self-employed people who will not turn up in this data set. Um, to give you an impression of what this data actually looks like, I've got a very simplified example of spell data for one individual person. You can see that we have several uh, time spells, all identified by the same person identifier, which shows one, well, the time series for one person. Um, these time spells are historical and they, can, they come from different data sources, and they can also be parallel or overlap and there can be gaps between those data spells. In this example, we have a person who was employed from January to June in 2002 with a regular employment contract, then became unemployed, and at the time has two parallel spells in our data set, which shows that he was registered at the Federal Employment Agency because he was looking for a job and being unemployed, and at the same time also received unemployment benefits. And after a period of several months, the person has found another job, and now we can see in the data there's a new spell for a regular employment. Um, okay. Apart from this basic information we've just seen in the previous slide, um, we have a whole lot of other variables in the data that are available. We have, like I just mentioned, person identifiers, firm identifiers, and very exact time periods. We have also got personal characteristics of the clients of the employment agencies or employees. This includes name, date of birth, gender, um, place of residence, um, all sorts of information in this direction. And then we have a main section in the data set which contains the information that depends on the administrative purpose. <coughs> so this will be different variables depending on whether somebody is unemployed, receives benefits, or is employed. Um, in the case of somebody being unemployed, this could be, for example, times of unemployment, um, the height of unemployment receipts, or maybe job search activities or job proposals made by the Federal Employment Agency. If somebody is employed, on the other hand, we would have all the information about the type of employment, the occupation of this person. Um, we would have the wages, times of employment, this kind of information. Um, finally, for employment information, it's also possible at the employment agency to link the, the firms, the people are employed, with um, internal process data. So we have information about the firms, about their location, their place of residence, or um, the, the branch of industry this firm is working in, for example. Um, this already shows that there's a very large amount of data available and all sorts of different information. But what we have to keep in mind is that this data is collected specifically for administrative purposes. So the use for research is secondary. So we, don't, we can't always influence every kind of information that's in the data set and also, this, has a, uh, this affects the quality of the data because everything that's relevant for the specific purpose, like for example, times of unemployment, if you're calculating benefit receipts, will be quite exact and very reliable. And other information that's additionally um, recorded can be less reliable if, for example, the agent was under stress in the situation when he was registering the data. Mm. And this 
leads us now a little bit to a few examples of how we try to prepare this data and how, to, how we would try to make it um, usable for researchers, I would say. Um, like I've already said, we start with the data that's collected in the central data warehouse and we organize it in time history data sets according to the different data sources. So we have a history of employment, history of labor market program participation, benefits and so on. Um, when we have these organized histories, then we then try to consolidate all the information into one major data product. This is our central data product, the IMV, um, which stands for Integrated Employment Biographies. Um, the idea is to integrate the information from all the different data sources, and then so that we have on a personal level the whole history of one person and all the aspects that are relevant for its labor market activities. So we would have a daily um, yeah, biography of all the activities of each individual person. <coughs> the data is, um, is um, prepared uh, once every year to be as up-to-date as is possible. Um, it dates back to 1975 until the last version is until 1916, uh, 2016. <laughs> um, and it covers about 18 million people in, in the last version of this data set. Um, I would now like to give you a few examples of the problems we have when we try to integrate and consolidate all this data into one data product. Um, and some strategies of how we try to deal with it. Um, one of the problems is, of course, because we have so many different data sources. This means we also have different IT systems the data comes from. Um, we have different identifiers for each person in all the different data sources. And sometimes we find that we also have information that's inconsistent or contradictory. We could, for example, have one person that is apparently unemployed and employed at the same time. Um, um, it's not always possible to solve these contradictory information cases and our strategy in general is to try to leave the data as it is as much as possible and only consolidate in cases when we're really sure this correction is definitely correct and also in only very clearly defined cases so it's Everybody knows what kind of corrections are being made, and so it's understandable for people who use the data afterwards. Um, one example would be a consolidating time spans. We could, for example, check whether the begin date of one episode is actually before the end date of the episodes. Possibility checks of this kind. And then sometimes it's possible to match um, overlapping times and to put them in the correct order, so to speak. Sometimes it's not possible, and so our main focus is basically on providing a really good documentation, especially of any problems in the data we found, and in the end we try to not lose information because we try to correct data spells, but just document it and then afterwards leave it to the researchers to see what they can find out from this information. The central part of this consolidation and creating data products and the first thing we have to do is to identify people in different data sources. Um, this is done by some <coughs> core attributes of each person which we think should be reliable in most of the data sources. This is basically the name of the person, gender, date of birth and if we can match a person by these criteria in different data sources. We can also match the original identifiers like the social security number in the employment data and the client number in the employment agency client data. And all of the identifiers we've matched will be combined in one standardized um, identifier and this is what we call a standardized statistical person. Um, the diagram on the right is meant to show this process a little bit in numbers. You can see that in general we have 130 million client numbers 
of federal employment agency processes. We have 100 million social security numbers, and these are merged and combined, and later on consolidated to 108 million people we think are actually one person. Um, this merge is, of course, not done if we're not sure or if the case is not clear, because it's always easier to merge cases afterwards than to divide something that we've put together. Also, this process of identifying standardized statistical person is an ongoing process. It's, it's repeated every month when we get new data, and it can also change over time, because there's new information available. Um, finally, I've got a few points about problems in historical data, because we have this very long time series, and it will always happen that we have breaks in historical recordings of the data. There can be changes in legislations, in the IT systems, the way the data is recorded, and sometimes there's even insufficient documentation of very old data sets. Most of the time, it's not possible to consolidate these kind of breaches. It's just something that comes with historical data. Um, so our focus is basically on providing documentation and trying to describe as exactly as possible the old facts before the breach and now the new facts and what changed in between. In some cases, we can update, for example, regional information from old structures to new structures. And the same is true for, for example, changing job classifications, which change every few years. And it's possible to map the older information to the new structure to make the data a bit better usable. All these examples show that it's very important to have a really good documentation and to describe clearly what's done for the people who use the data. Um, this leads me to the last part, um, providing data to researchers. Um, the data and IT management is an internal department of the IRB. Our main focus is actually on preparing the data, exploring data sources, and providing documentation, like I just said. We also do a lot of checks to assure data quality, and one of our tasks is also to um, to provide the IT infrastructure of the Institute to make the researchers able to work with this data. What we also do is that we give um, access to this data by in form of sp project specific data extracts. This can vary a lot depending on which project is going to ask and is covered by very strict data regulation rules. Um, one example could be a project trying to evaluate active labor market policy programs. For example, the promotion of further vocational training. For a project who wants to study the effects of this program, it's often very useful to identify in the whole data set exactly the people who took part in this measure and identify this relevant group and maybe also other people who have similar characteristics and didn't take part in the program. Um, our job would then be to supply the entire employment biographies, everything that happened to these people before and after they took place in a specific program. And in some cases, it's also possible to provide addresses, so there can be a survey and researchers can ask questions to these people directly. Um, this type of data access is very limited though, because of the data protection regulations, and it's very strict um, requirements if you want one of these data sets. This is why the IRB also has the Data Research Centre, which job it is to make the data publicly available. And the main difference to make the data available to a broader public is that they create standardised samples in different stages of anonymization. So, this ranges from different types of access. A scientific use file is factually anonymous and can be downloaded by researchers to work with and the requirements are not so strict. On the other hand, they also have data that's less anonymized and less censored. And this is available, um, as we've seen before, in remote access or even in on-site usage and has 
because of that stricter regulations about how to use it. Mm. There are also other data products available at the Data Research Center, which is, for example, the combination of survey data of companies and all sorts of other surveys, um, which gives you further possibilities to see other data and combinations of administrative data and survey data. So the first address, if anybody is a researcher and wants to work with administrative data from the IRB, would always be to ask the research data center for advice. Um, to come to a conclusion, I thought about the way we try to provide a good research base for researchers and some aspects that are quite important to make this work. I think the main thing is also about communication. We have a lot of different um, institutions that work with the administrative data and provide it in different ways, which is the statistics department, the data and IT management, and also the data research center. And it's very important to work together to get the best results. And what's also really important is to get people with different skills and to yeah, combine these skills. And of course, it's also really important to talk to the people who are going to use the data, the researchers who know what exactly, what information is relevant, what kind of information and how we need to prepare it so they get the best use of it. And the final point, which I guess was in a lot of the slides as well, is about the documentation and metadata, which is really important to make these complicated data sources usable. Okay, um, I hope I could give you a small insight into our work and how we try to provide this database. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay, so the floor is open now to questions to Selina or also generally to one of the three speakers on research policy advice and data. I would like to ask you, can you link your labor market data set with other types of data set, for example, with school data uh, that you can track, for example, people from child into adulthood? Or is it something you, you would like to have and it's impossible due to data regulation? Mm -hmm. um, it's actually something that's done for different projects, so it's possible. Um, you have to get, um, you have to get an about, well, you have the data protection regulations, so we have to get um, a grant that you're allowed to do this in special cases. So it has to be a research um, project. But basically it's possible to link people by their name and date of birth and other information that might be available about them. This is not always possible in 100% <coughs> of the cases, but there are matching processes where you have a relatively good rate of identification in the data sources. Okay. Other questions, remarks? Perhaps I can add uh, an example of this. We, we got data for, from different universities, uh, from the graduates from different universities, and uh, we, uh, we can combine the data with the social security data so we can follow the, the person with, with different. Uh, fields of study or in, uh, different uh, personal characteristics uh, over the, the uh, employment histories in a, uh, of course, an unrest uh, way. But uh, there's an interesting ongoing research on that. Okay. So, um, if there aren't any questions now, we are perfectly in time and I would like to uh, thank the three speakers, Joachim Möller, Martin Dietz and Silvina Kopsteig for their contributions and also the audience for joining the discussion. And uh, we have now a break um, in some of the rooms over there. Daniel will yeah. continue.